Hi, welcome to Statistics One. This is the first lecture, and the topic for this lecture is experimental research. As I mentioned in the introduction video, it's important to know as either a consumer of, of statistics or as someone engaged in statistical analyses, what type of research are you doing? What kinds of questions are you asking and, and what kinds of questions might you ask of your data? So in this first week, we'll talk about first experimental research here in lecture one and then correlational research in lecture two because they have a very different feel uh, and they, they typically work with uh, very different kinds of data. Uh, so let's hear this first lecture talk about experimental research. This first lecture is broken up into three segments and that'll be common as we go through the course. Uh, each lecture will be typically broken into either two or three segments, uh, hopefully around 10 minutes each, but uh, that'll fluctuate a bit. Um, so in this first lecture, we have three segments. The first one, I'll give you just an example of experimental research in action, uh, the polio vaccine trials. Uh, another, in the second segment, I'll give you another example, uh, more recent research on working memory training. And then in the third segment, we'll talk more about this concept of randomness. Uh, you'll see an important aspect to experimental research is random selection from a population and random assignment to conditions. So let's go into this first segment. In the first half of the 20th century, uh, there were approximately 20,000 cases of polio per year in the USA. In 1952 was a particularly bad year. There were 58,000 cases just in that one year alone. And polio was a very debilitating disease. It was very frightening. Uh, it ha it, it was, uh, happened among children of all uh, backgrounds. Um, and some years, uh, as I noted here, 1952 were particularly bad and, 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 and worrying. Um, so in 1952, the first effective polio vaccine was developed by Dr. Jonas Salk. And how do we know in retrospect, uh, you know, over 60 years later, how do we know that it was effective? Well, through experimental research, more specifically through randomized controlled experiments. And this set of studies is now known as the Salk vaccine trials. Uh, one of the greatest examples of experimental research put to use to solve a very critical problem facing uh, modern society. And it's a really uh, great success story of, ex of experimental research. So how did it work? Well, to do experimental research, again, go back to the introductory lecture, we need a sample and we need a population. So what was the population? At first, the population was all children in the USA. And it tip, actually, the population really is all children worldwide. Uh, but these initial studies were funded by the US government, uh, the SOC vaccine trials. So I'll define the population as all children in the US. That's, that's who SOC was uh, hoping he could generalize his vaccine results to, uh, is all children in the US. The sample, of course, he couldn't get his hands on all children in the US. So the sample initially was just 4,000 children from the state of Virginia. Uh, that turned out to be pretty, uh, uh, pretty promising results from that first sample. So the US government uh, funded the research further and they expanded the sample ultimately to include 1.8 million children from 44 of the 50 United States. So in this experiment, the independent variable, or what some people might call the treatment, is what the child actually receives. So some children received the actual live vaccine, the polio vaccine, and other children received a placebo. So they got a vaccine, but there was no uh, live, voli live polio vaccine, it was just uh, placebo. The dependent variable is what you measure after the treatment. So the dependent variable was 
you can think of this in one of two ways. One, if you look at the level of the individual child, you could think of it as a polio diagnosis. So each individual child is either going to have a polio diagnosis, so we, we could score that as a one, or uh, no, not be diagnosed with polio, so we score that as a zero. Um, or if we look at the, the uh, level of a community of children, so if we look at towns or villages or states, um, then we could look at the rate of polio among a certain number of children. So two different ways to score this uh, dependent variable. One of the cool things about using the SOC vaccine trial as an example to start this course is it was a double-blind experiment. And those are actually pretty rare in, experiment, in experimental psychology or in, in uh, experimental trials uh, in general, because it's difficult to do. What I mean by double-blind is that the experimenter didn't know if the treatment that they were giving to the child was the placebo or was the vaccine. So the person administering uh, the actual vaccine didn't know if the child was getting the vaccine or getting the placebo. So no one on site at the time knew which one the child was getting and the child and the parents, they didn't know if they were getting the vaccine or the placebo. The final results from several trials can be summarized here. This is the rate per 100,000. So children who were given the vaccine 28 out of 100,000 went on to develop polio versus the control who got a placebo, 71 out of 100,000 developed polio. So you can see almost three times more children who did not receive the vaccine went on to develop polio. So we can see just looking at these numbers that this was a success story. And sure enough, the U.S. continued to use the SOC vaccine, and by 1994, polio had been completely eradicated from all of the Americas. So this is a great success story of how we can see experimental research put to use to solve a problem and eradicate what I call bad stuff. Um, so to summarize this segment, the major benefit of experimental research is they allow for strong claims about causality. So why does stuff happen? So why was the polio uh, vaccine happening? Well, there was this, this disease that was spreading through communities. Salk thought he had a vaccine that could prevent it. And sure enough, if he gave the, gave the vaccination to enough children, they were able to prevent the bad stuff from happening. So again, experiments allow us to make causal claims about why stuff happens. So that allows us to predict stuff, which means we can pre prevent bad stuff and we can promote good stuff. <laughs> so we use it in very basic terms, right? Um, so this is an example where society saw we have a lot of bad stuff happening, we have this disease we have to eradicate, and if we can do an experiment to predict uh, why it's happening and how we can stop it, then indeed we can stop it. And that's what the SOC vaccine trials uh, were able to do. These strong causal claims require a lot of things. So they require what I call true independent variables. That is, a, a group of, of subjects, or in this case, a group of children come to a facility and they're randomly assigned to receive one uh, level of a variable or another. So they were randomly assigned to receive the vaccine or the, or the placebo. That's a true independent variable. I'll talk in the next lecture about uh, sort of quasi-independent variables uh, that aren't as strong as this. Um, it requires a random and representative sample. So uh, in initially, the SOC vaccine trials only were done on uh, children from Virginia. And maybe it only worked in that subset of, of children. Maybe it wouldn't generalize to the entire United States. They had to see, so they had to broaden their sample 
get a more random representative sample of the entire United States to see if it really worked. Fortunately, it did. Um, and finally, experimental research and these strong causal claims uh, depend on the require that we don't have any confounds in the experiment. And that's almost impossible to rule out entirely. There might always be confounds. So there could have been confounds in terms of the age of the children, or again, the geographical location, or their socioeconomic status. There could have been lots of confounds in this uh, example. Fortunately, they ruled out most of those uh, in the research as they were doing uh, the, the vaccine trials. Um, but it's something to keep in mind as we look at experimental research. Um, these strong causal claims require that there are no confounds lurking behind, uh, lurking in the shadows. Um, and we'll address that issue a little bit more directly in the next segment as we look at working memory training.